I'm Jeff Melvoin, one of a bevy of past presidents of University Synagogue here today. What a privilege and pleasure it is to be part of such a lovely Hamish service this morning, for which on behalf I think of everybody here, I commend all those responsible. Last year at this time, some of you may recall, I illustrated a certain musical connection between Jewish liturgy and the songs of Gershwin, Bernstein, and Sondheim. Never before had I experienced such a broad and immediate reaction. And I want to assure you that in response to your many comments, I will not sing from the pulpit today. <laughs> Instead, I'd like to talk about lodgepole pine trees, Kaddish, Ecclesiastes, and gefilte fish though not necessarily in that order. In our family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. So begins Norman McLean's masterful story, A River Runs Through It. McLean was writing about his family in western Montana, but he could have been writing about my family on the north shore of Chicago, almost. McLean's father, was a Presbyterian minister and a fly fisherman who tied his own flies and taught others. My father was the shofar blower at our congregation for over 50 years and a fly fisherman who also tied his own flies and taught others. McLean writes of his father, he told us about Christ's disciples being fishermen and we were left to assume as my brother and I did, that all first-class fishermen on the Sea of Galilee were fly fishermen, and that John, the favorite, was a dry fly fisherman. Well, my father didn't talk about Christ's disciples. He didn't talk much about Abraham's disciples either, but he very clearly taught my brother and me that fly fishermen are the Kohanim of the angling world and that dry fly fishermen are the Levites of that priestly class. Reading the river, matching the hatch, a felt hat, Dunhill pipe, and pewter flask. Such were the sacraments that my father honored, the rituals we observed. My father died this March at the age of 84, and so I found myself this summer back at the fish camp in Idaho with my family to scatter his ashes and help my mother sort through his things. Fish camp was my dad's rather fanciful name for what in reality is a gracious four bedroom house he built on the Henry's Fork of the Snake River. My brother and I plan to keep it going, but of course it will never be the same. I was reflecting on this during a drive through Yellowstone Park with my wife. The western entrance to Yellowstone is only 35 miles from the fish camp, so we tend to spend a lot of time there. It's been 25 years since the great fires of 1988 swept through Yellowstone, ravaging more than a third of its 2.2 million acres, and the evidence is still all around you in the skeletal remains of hundreds of thousands of lodgepole pine trees that burned. At the time, many observers described the loss as catastrophic. Yet 25 years on, different truths have emerged. Mature lodgepoles are so dominant, they eventually block sunlight from other trees, notably the beautiful aspens, which can't survive beneath the towering canopy. Today, there is evidence that aspens may reemerge in Yellowstone because of the fires. Similarly, the inferno removed years of ground cover, allowing a host of plant and animal life to reemerge in the park, which subsequently has promoted the return of certain bird life, including predators who can once more penetrate to the forest floor. Curiously, even the lodgepole forest itself is benefiting. The pine cones on many lodgepoles are what scientists call serotonous. They're sealed by a resin 
that only melts and releases seeds at temperatures over 130 degrees. In other words, the regeneration of a healthy lodgepole forest is actually dependent upon the cyclical destruction of fire. It's a paradox. One I found striking in the shadow of my father's passing. A great tree falls and we mourn its loss, yet suddenly the sun shines where it hasn't been seen for years. Strange, troubling, yet somehow comforting at the same time. And I found myself thinking about that great book of paradox, Ecclesiastes. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to keep and a time to cast away. It may be hard for those of us over 50 to separate that passage from memories of the hit single by the birds, but if you can, if you can come to those words with fresh eyes, you realize that these are not simple bromides from the Woodstock generation, but hard truths only arrived at by someone who had lived fully and suffered greatly. Whoever wrote that book still has much to teach us, as do so many of our stories, rituals, and traditions, if we let them. Kaddish, for example. When I returned home after my father's memorial service in Chicago, Rabbi Feinstein convinced me to sit shiva here in Los Angeles while the rest of my family remained in the Midwest to comfort my mother. With less than two days' notice, over 50 of you appeared at my home to honor my dad and help me through my grief. And many other of you contributed in the days to follow. Now, I happen to know something about the historical basis of Kaddish, having written a Northern Exposure episode about it. Why is a minion necessary to say Kaddish? As with every aspect of Judaism, large or small, there's more than one opinion. One explanation is that the mourner shouldn't be left to grieve alone. Another tougher variation on that theme is that a minion provides irrefutable evidence that despite our loss, life goes on, the family goes on, the Jewish community goes on. I may have known this, but I had not experienced it until recently. An old tree falls and new light shines on the forest floor. Life will have life. Just as scientists now acknowledge that the processes of death and renewal within Yellowstone are more complicated and mysterious than was first recognized, so too can we acknowledge that the affairs of humankind are more complicated and mysterious than any individual can comprehend. But we are not alone in our search for meaning. At its core, I believe Judaism, Reform Judaism in particular, endures not because it provides answers to life's mysteries, but because it provides the right questions. It frames the puzzle of our existence. Why are we here? How shall we live? We look to our stories, our culture, and traditions for guidance and strength. We look to each other, particularly at this time of year, which asks us to wrestle with the most fundamental of our desires and fears. During these 10 days of awe, we find ourselves suspended between the poles of life and death, regeneration and atonement, memory and hope. Time is sanctified for us to both reflect and project. The old year dies, the new is born, and who can say how our landscape will change, individually, collectively, physically, spiritually. As a congregation, we know that our synagogue environment will change in the new year, 
as Canafrela gradually moves into emeritus status. And I emphasize gradually. Talk about a lodgepole pine. Cantor J has towered over us for years, 40 years, as he tells us, providing countless hours of shelter, guidance, beauty, and inspiration. I, like so many of you, will deeply miss his regular presence. Now, he's not going away anytime soon, but we know change is in the wind, and this place will not be the same. No, it will be different, but it will go on. Not without heartbreak, perhaps. Not without kvetching, to be sure. But we'll adjust, as the cantor would want us to, because it's the natural order of things. As our tradition teaches, as the poet of Ecclesiastes reminds us, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Back at the fish camp in July, my brother, my older son, and I put on waders and walked out the back porch bearing a box of ashes and a lifetime of memories. In the fading rays of sunset, we let the river carry my father away to forever mingle with the trout he loves so much. Yes, the fish camp will be different now, for my brother and me particularly. For my children, less so. And for their children, how could it be different? Different from what? It will be all they know, the way they encounter it, the way that we teach it to them. And when they ask, who's that old bearded guy in the photos with the felt hat and the Dunhill pipe and the broad smile, we'll tell them and explain how to spot a rise and how to mend a cast and drink from a pewter flask and a thousand other things, religion and fly fishing. Not so clear a line at all, really. And with thoughts of trout water in my head, I'll end with a final paradox from Ecclesiastes. All rivers run to the sea, yet the sea is not full. Which at long last brings me to those little white envelopes taped to the back of your chairs. Each year you give to the annual appeal, yet each year somehow those envelopes return. <laughs> the sea is not full. It's a paradox, but one with an explanation. Our dues do not cover yet all of the synagogue's operational costs, which is why we rely on your additional generosity at this time to bridge the difference, thus funding many important programs and services we couldn't otherwise afford. It's a, built, it's a bit like a filter fish. You may not like it, but somehow the meal wouldn't be complete without it. <laughs> and grandma's feelings would be hurt if you just pushed it around the plate. So don't hurt grandma's feelings. Take a healthy bite. Please look into your hearts once again. Think of what this synagogue means to you. Think of sustaining this forest we inhabit with all of its peaks and valleys its rivers and streams, its sunshine and rain, and be as generous as you can. Ushers will be coming around to collect your donations. You can turn them in all week, but do it now. And as the ushers circulate, please allow me to wish you and your loved ones the happiest of New Year's. <laughs>